Hi everyone, and welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to learn how to use big O notation to perform computations with Taylor series. Of course, when you look at a Taylor series now, it might not be clear how big O fits in. We don't have any big O in our definition. So what's the connection? Well, it turns out the key here is Taylor's inequality. As a reminder, Taylor's inequality says that if f of x is written as the sum of its nth order Taylor polynomial centered at x0, and a remainder term rn of x, then that remainder term in absolute value at some point x is bounded by a constant k divided by n plus 1 factorial times the absolute value of x minus x0 to the n plus 1. Okay, now let's take a step back and have another look at this inequality. Does this remind you of anything, maybe from the last lesson? Hopefully it does. This should look a lot like the definition of big O. What this inequality is saying is that this remainder term, rn of x, is bounded by a constant times the absolute value of x minus x naught to the n plus 1. It's saying that as x approaches x naught, rn of x is big O of x minus x naught to the n plus 1. Let's take a moment to appreciate what we've just observed here. This remainder term, rn of x, represents an infinite sum of powers of x. It's the tail of our Taylor series, right? It's a pretty gross expression. In many applications, however, we aren't so concerned with the precise values of the terms in r of x. We're more interested in understanding the order of those terms. Does r of x grow at a rate that's comparable to a quadratic, a cubic, or a polynomial of degree 100? That's the information that's important to us, and that's what we encode with this big O notation. So we can simply refer to our Taylor series as f of x equals p n x naught of x plus big O of x minus x naught to the n plus 1. Much more compact and often a lot easier to work with. Let's see some examples on the next slide. For our first example, consider the Maclaurin series of the function f of x equals e to the x. Maybe in this example, we're only concerned with the precise values of the first three terms, the quadratic approximation of our function. The terms afterward aren't so important, but we do still care about the order of those terms. In this case, we can write our Maclaurin series much more compactly as 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, and then the remaining terms, as we saw in the last slide, will be of order x to the n plus 1. So we add big O of x cubed, and this is valid as x approaches 0. We could do the same sort of thing with the Maclaurin series for cos x. Let's suppose once again that we're primarily interested in the quadratic approximation, and for the remainder, it's really just the order that's important to us. In that case, we could write our series as 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial, and recognize that all of our remainder terms have order x to the 4. We add big O of x to the 4 as x goes to 0, and there you go, nice and compact. Notice it would also have been correct to write big O of x cubed as x goes to 0, or big O of x squared, or big O of x. After all, if our remainder is bounded in absolute value by a constant times the absolute value of x to the 4, then it's also bounded by a constant times the absolute value of x cubed or a constant times the absolute value of x squared, and so on. However, this expression gives us the most information about the order of our remainder. As a third example, adding two Maclaurin series now becomes quite a bit simpler. We don't have to worry about adding infinitely many terms. If we're only interested in a low degree approximation for the sum, we can add the terms that matter and leave the rest to big O. So suppose, for example, that you want to know the Maclaurin series for e to the x plus cos x. Well, we have a nice compact expression for the Maclaurin series for e to the x, and a nice compact expression for the Maclaurin series for cos x. If we add these expressions together, we're going to get 2 plus x, and then our quadratic terms kill each other. Finally, we add our big O terms, plus big O of x cubed, plus big O of x to the 4. Now we don't need two big O expressions in our sum. Remember that if x is going to zero, then when you add something of order x cubed to something of order x to the four, you should get something of order x cubed, the smaller of the two exponents. This was one of the properties of big O that we saw at the end of the last lesson. With this in mind, we can write our expression a little bit more simply as two plus x plus big O of x cubed as x goes to zero. 
multiplying two Taylor series now also becomes feasible. Suppose, for example, that you wanted to know the Maclaurin series for the product of these two functions, the square root of 1 plus x and sine x. Well, the first function's Maclaurin series could be found using our binomial series. You'd find that the first couple terms are 1 plus x over 2, and the remaining terms are of order x squared. The Maclaurin series for sine x, on the other hand, we've seen many times already. It's made up of odd powers of x. So the first term is x, and the remaining terms are all of order x cubed as x goes to 0. To multiply these two series, distribute the terms as you normally would. By first multiplying this 1 into the second bracket, we get x plus big O of x cubed. Then we multiply this x over 2 term into the second bracket, giving us x squared over 2 plus x over 2 big O of x cubed. And finally, we multiply the big O term into the second bracket. We get x big O of x squared plus big O of x squared big O of x cubed. At this point, we can start to simplify our expression. We have two terms that don't have any big O. So I'm going to write those terms first. I have x plus x squared over 2. Next, I add my big O terms. I have big O of x cubed plus x over 2 times big O of x cubed. Oh, but remember, if I have something that's of order x cubed and I multiply it by x over 2, the order is now going to go up to x to the 4. So here's a term of order x to the 4. Next, I have x times big O of x squared. That's going to give me a term of order x cubed. So I add big O of x cubed. And finally, I have something of order x squared times something of order x cubed. Well, if you think back to the properties that I showed you at the end of the last lesson, we know that the exponents are going to add here. I'm going to end up with something of order x to the 5. Okay, great. Can we simplify this expression further? I think so. Notice that we have a sum of four big O terms. But once again, our properties tell us that as x goes to 0, a sum of big O terms, x cubed, x to the 4, x5, etc., is going to give us something of order x to the smallest of these exponents. So in this case, I get something of order x cubed. I can write my series very compactly as x plus x squared over 2 plus big O of x cubed. If you aren't yet sold on big O notation, think about how you would multiply these series without it. You'd have infinitely many terms in each bracket, and so you'd have to do a lot of distributions. It would be a big mess, and you could never write down the whole thing. Big O really cleans up the situation. Another thing that we can do with Taylor and Maclaurin series is division. We can take one Taylor series and divide it by another to get a Taylor series for the quotient of our two functions. Suppose, for example, that we've found the Maclaurin series for sine of x, and we've expressed it in big O notation as x minus x cubed over 6 plus something of order x to the 5. We've done the same for e to the x squared. We've obtained 1 plus x squared plus terms of order x to the 4. To find the Maclaurin series for the quotient of these two functions, we can essentially do polynomial long division, except now we have some big O terms to include. Now I'm going to do my best to remind you of how this process works, but you may want to do a little review on polynomial long division if you're feeling a little rusty. We start with a division sign. Outside that division sign, we include the expression that's doing the dividing, the divisor. In this case, it's 1 plus x squared plus big O of x to the 4. Inside the division sign, we include the expression that's being divided. In this case, x minus x cubed over 6 plus big O of x to the 5. Now, if you think back to polynomial long division in high school, you may remember working with the largest powers of x in each expression. Well, here, we don't really have a largest power of x. This represents infinitely many terms, and the exponents are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So instead, we're going to work with the smallest powers of x. The first question we have to ask ourselves is, what do I have to multiply this term, 1, by, to match the smallest term inside the division sign? In this case, the answer is x. So I'll put x up top, and we multiply that by the divisor outside. I write my answer down here below. I get x plus x cubed, and then when I multiply something of order x to the 4 by x, I'm going to get something of order x to the 5, so plus big O of x to the 5. Next, I'm going to take the difference of the two expressions in my division sign, the top line minus the bottom line. My x terms are going to go away, 
my x cubed terms are gonna give me minus seven over six x cubed. And lastly, I take big O of x to the five minus big O of x to the five. Now that's not zero because these expressions could represent lots of different functions. All we know is that when we combine two expressions of order x to the five, the result is also going to be something of order x to the five. So I just write big O of x to the five. And now we repeat the process. We ask ourselves, what do we have to multiply this smallest term by to get minus seven over six x cubed? Well, I think it's gonna be minus seven over six x cubed. So I'll put that up at the top. I multiply this number by my divisor and write it down below. When I multiply by one, I get minus seven over six x cubed. And notice that when I multiply by the remaining terms, everything else is gonna be of order x to the five, right? When I multiply by x squared, I get something times x to the five. And when I multiply by big O of x to the four, I'm gonna get something of order x to the seven. But as x goes to zero, we can represent that using a smaller power, right? We can represent that as big O of x to the five. So I'm just gonna write big O of x to the five down here. You can see that when we take the difference, we're left with zero plus big O of x to the five. And there you have it, folks. The Maclaurin series for our quotient is given by x minus seven over six x cubed that's the answer that we got up here, with a remainder of big O of x to the five. Of course, all of this is taking place as x goes to zero.